Uh, Christine is the uh, clinical lead for genetic counselling at Genomics England and also our Caldicott Guardian, which is a term uh, involving responsibility for patient data and the patient interest. Uh, she has an illustrious background. I've worked with her many times uh, in the past on the Human Genetics Commission. She was a genetic counsellor at Guy's at St. Thomas's and president of the European Society of Human Genetics and a long list of things that I won't embarrass her about. So thank you very much for asking me to do this section of the talk. And I just want to say again, thank you to Julian. Um, the participant panel are appropriately challenging and appropriately critical but I think can be said to be a huge strength of the 100,000 Genomes Project. So what I was asked to talk to was um, tools and training, which we've covered a little bit earlier. Um, I haven't particularly included issues about data access and policies, but I'm really happy to take questions about that if um, people have those questions as well. <clears throat> so when I first got this talk, I thought tools for what and training for who? And I think that's a really important thing to understand when developing these systems. As, I, as Mark said, my background is I was originally a nurse and a genetic counsellor. I've been heavily involved in the development of genetic counselling as a new profession in UK and Europe. And the context of what I'm going to talk about is the 100,000 Genomes Project to the Genomic Medicine Service and Genomics Medicine in the NHS. I'm focusing on the sort of patient participant related workforce. Of course, there is a, another big workforce around uh, tech developments, bioinformatics, all those sorts of things. But in this presentation, I'm focusing on the patient participant relation workforce. And also thinking about which we've touched on in, is this challenge of genetics expertise being located within a specialist workforce, when in fact the ambition is to move this to mainstream healthcare. And I absolutely support that because I want every person who is is entitled to a genetic test that is useful to for that to happen quickly at the right time and efficiently within the patient pathway. So the 100,000 Genomes Project, if you've heard a number of times, was a partnership between the uh, NHS and the actual project. And I think it's important to recognise that it was built on existing structures. It was built on clinical genetics as a recognised me medical specialty. Clinical genetics is not a recognised medical specialty in all countries in Europe. It was also used genetic counsellors as an established and registered profession, um, and genetic counsellors exist in different ways in countries in Europe. The programme actually funded an additional NHS funded training programme for genetic counsellors, and the genetic counsellors that are starting to come out of that programme are registered as clinical scientists but essentially have the same competencies as, for example, somebody like me who's registered with the Genetic Counselor Registration Board. The other important clin uh, uh, clinically, almost clinically facing staff in the UK are laboratory scientists. And laboratory scientists are established and registered professions, so they work autonomously. And I think in terms of um, activities such as variant interpretation, the sort of uh, the, the bridge between the genomic analysis and the final validated result to the patient. In the UK, the laboratory scientists are also an established and registered profession. So I just put up some numbers here. So this is a paper from 2019 based on 2017 data about the number of trained genetic counsellors in the world. Um, their estimates, but there's less than 10,000, significantly less than 10,000. And as I've indicated before, the composition of workforce is health system and country development. And the place of clinical genetics as a, as a specialist health service is health system and country dependent. And even more, I suppose, importantly, the roles and responsibilities of various professions in a health system is, is different depending on which country you come from. And I think that is very marked across Europe. My perspective is working in the UK, as a nurse and allied health professional, I can, uh, a, um, a, um, I'm sorry, the questions get distracting. <laughs> I will answer that one. Um, as a nurse and allied health professional, I can develop enough professional skills to be competent to work autonomously within the health service. I don't work on behalf of a doctor. I work as a separate health professional. So essentially what I'm saying here is there's no one size fits all. 
Um, here we are, genomics and nursing. These are general nursing. If you look at the stats across Europe from the number of nurses and midwives and the number of physicians, there's 4.1 million nurses and midwives in Europe and 1.7 million physicians in Europe. And in order to deliver genomic medicine equitably, safely and competently, we absolutely have to engage with that workforce. And particularly, I would say nurses and midwives are the largest patient facing group of health professionals in Europe. Um, there have been competencies developed in genomics for nurses, and these are really in uh, UK, USA and Japan. In the UK, there is a big focus now on upskilling the general nursing workforce. So this is not upskilling them to be genetic specialists, but upskilling them to be able to use genomic medicine and access, access it and, in, and for the benefit of their patients. And there's a global nursing alliance, which I'm involved with, which is um, looking at basic competencies for nurses internationally. So that's the bit on works workforce. Um, tools was the other um, bit I was asked to talk about. I thought I'd just select one tool that we've developed, which was we developed from learning from the 100,000 Genomes Project, have developed in partnership with the NHS and has been co-created with NHS professionals, patients and our participants. Of course, there are a number of other tools that were necessary to develop to allow clinicians to interact with data and feed it back to patients, for example, interpretation portals. Um, the test ordering system for the Genomic Medicine Service is a national system, one, one entry portal into ordering a, a genetic genome, well, genetic test, in fact. The test directory is a national tool that says what tests are available, funded, what technology should be used across um, Europe. So what I want to talk about here is the consent process within a healthcare son contest. And as Alex has indicated, the aim of the um, genomic medicine service is that every one of the aims is that all eligible patients, and at the moment that's patients having whole, whole genome sequencing as a clinical test, so not as a research genome, are offered the opportunity to join the National Genomic Research Library. We have various uh, terms for this. We, we are now sort of becoming fixed on the National Genomic Research Library. And in fact, that's what our protocol and uh, uh, um, health, re health regulatory authority registration is based around. But essentially, the National Genomic Research Lib Library has built on what we built for the 100,000 Genomes Project. All the data that the participants of the 100,000 Genomes Project allow us to access is in that library now. And it's a comprehensive resource that allows access to genomic data, other associated health data. And it's, it's a partnership between NHS England and Genomics England. So the aim is for every patient having a whole genome sequence to be offered this chance. But of course, that's happening in a healthcare setting as part of a clinical interaction. And there's a tension there. Of course, patients need to have sufficient time and information to make an informed choice. But what we don't want to do is delay genetic testing, make it more difficult. And that is a tension, and it's a tension we're working through. Um, we're not quite there yet, um, but we're working through it in partnership, again, with our colleagues in the NHS and the Genomic Medicine Service Alliances. But one of the things that has helped is a simplification of the consent process. And um, I, what I've put up on the screen here is the recording consent. We've called this patient choice because the choice for the patient is, sh should I have this genetic test? And in order to make that decision, they need to know what the test is for and what the out potential outcomes are. But they also need, in the principle of transparency, to know where the data was going to be stored, who will have access to it for clinical care, but who will have access to it for clinical care. Um, and so they are making a choice about having the genomic test and are having a discussion about it. And there's a one pager on that. The things that are highlighted on that one page were came out of, again, discussions with participants, with health professionals. 
So things like uncertainty, things like their genomic test result will be used for clinical care for family members and that the data for clinical care, their data will be compared to other people's data and other people's data will be compared to theirs. And sometimes that will happen on a national level and occasionally that will happen on an international level for the use case of clinical care. Um, the consent page for the research decision, again, is one page and it, talk, it has the, what is the library. Again, the important components I think are unsurprising, but security, recontact, what the data and samples will be used for, how they will be stored and how people can withdraw. Of course, this is backed up by additional information, um, by um, uh, resources on the website, printed, et cetera, et cetera. They are still being developed though. Um, the learning from the hundred, if we think of consent as a conversation, some people need a lot of information, but some people don't. And we shouldn't be forcing pages and pages of pages of tick boxes and information down people's throats if they don't need it, if they trust if they're happy with the decision, but we should make that available if they do need it to make an informed decision. So coming on to education. So at the start of the 100,000 Genomes Project, I wasn't working for them, but um, there were, we did develop a lot of resources in-house, um, and um, but the funded, Health Education England funded education programme was established in 2014 and has been absolutely vital both for developing the um, competencies to deliver the 100,000 Genomes Project, but now in the Genomic Medicine Service. And I'm just, I've been given these slides by colleagues in Health Education England, and I really thank them for it. Um, I'm just going to go through the slides, which gives an examples of the types of resources that have been developed. So there's very simple, short online modules designed for the health professional who wants to know more about it but doesn't have much background knowledge. Um, there is certificates available so people can use it as evidence of formal uh, CPD. And I recommend these a lot. And these are freely available to uh, universities and the NHS within the UK. And if other people want access to it through um, you know, all the Genomics England staff also all have access to this. And some of the materials are publicly available. There are resources for the wider workforce. So uh, an MSc in genomic medicine has been funded um, for national health uh, service workers. Um, individual modules can be taken for um, people for continuing professional development, for example, from bioinformatics to um, uh, introduction to genetic counseling. There are various online courses, MOOCs, um, that form part of postgraduate, some of them form part of postgraduate medical training. Others are just open to everybody. Um, what's really interesting in some of the MOOCs is the amount of public participation, which is um, fascinating and absolutely great that professionals and public are access the same resources and learning the same things. Um, there's been specialty specific web pages and resources. Health Education England uses blogs and social media and signposting a lot, which is very effective. I'm, I'm old. I don't engage in social media very much, but I even did get a Twitter account to access the Health Education England <laughs> signposting. What has also been developed as a co-creation between health professionals, mainstream prof health professionals, specialist health professionals is competency frameworks. Health professionals who aren't genetic specialists are not starting from a level of zero. They have their own skills and knowledge. They have their own competencies in, in, in um, delivering healthcare. And what we should be thinking about is adding to that, not saying they're missing something, but enabling them to use the skills and competencies that's already got and add genomic healthcare to those skills and competencies where it's relevant. So, as I said, these are being co-designed um, each competency framework is provided with links to supporting educational resources. And we also have to consider professional judgment based on an individual scope of practice. So, for example, as a nurse, I have a scope of practice. 
and, I, and it's my judgment as to whether I work, I'm working within it or working without it. As health professionals, registered health professionals, we are accountable for our own practice. And if I move outside of my scope of practice, I can be disciplined, struck off, all those sorts of things. But if I, if I, it's my judgment, my personal judgment, that I, an understanding of my scope of practice that means I practice safely and competently. So the competency frameworks could be used for individual clinicians to identify learning needs. Some, some of the medical colleges have adopted them for use in under and postgraduate training. It can be used for those delivering training to identify training needs of healthcare professional groups. And each GMSA has a training coordinator at, um, of the different job titles, but essentially within the GMSA structures, training and for mainstream of healthcare is an important component. And it also provides a, a needs analysis in that if you're developing resources, you can then see where your gaps are. Um, there are specific resources to support the genomic medicine service. So there's a whole page on genomics and nursing, primary care, neurology, lots and lots of different um, uh, specialties. Um, there's general stuff about genomic testing, further support for nurses or, or health professionals generally. Um, and all these, as I keep saying before, all these resources are free to the work source. And there are more detailed guidance for supporting whole genome sequencing, how to request the test, what the National Genomic Research Library is, when you can re re request the test. Whole genome sequencing is in a, well, very soft launch phase. It is happening. It's happening mostly within clinical genetic services at the moment, but that's absolutely right because we need to test the system first. But the aim is that it will be rolled out and available more widely as time goes on, as Alex indicated. So <clears throat> just some general conclusions. So who needs training and what tools are used will be context specific across Europe. But I would argue really strongly, genomic medicine is not gonna deliver its ambitions if it doesn't work across the whole healthcare workforce. It's not just the business of the specialist genetic workforce. A really important uh, factor in the success of this, of the 100,000 Genomes Project and the future success of the Genomic Medicine Service is that it was supported by this separate funded workforce development across the whole workforce. Um, it didn't involve large increases in the special workforce, but it has identified where that will need to be considered. Um, so, um, but it wasn't dependent on there being a specialist, large specialist workforce. And what the 100,000 Genomes Project did, because it was in partnership with the NHS and because it was collaborative across the whole workforce, it did sort of pump prime the system a bit. It's not been easy, it's not been straightforward, it's still not easy, it's still not straightforward, but it's created a, a cadre of people who, who woke up to genomics, who could say, yeah, hang on a minute, because I recruited these patients to the um, 100,000 Genomes Project, or because I have employed to um, manage the care of this new patient group, I can see its relevance to me. I can see its relevance to my work and relevance to my patients. And that's been very powerful because the intention is to embed genomic medicine in the NHS, but also to enable this um, library as a resource to facilitate research and facilitate new diagnosis, therapeutics and um, medicines. So